fraud, uh, there's a variety of fraud schemes that it can, can occur in the procurement of goods or services. Um, anything from bid rigging to kickbacks, uh, price fixing, um, product substitution, where you procure goods and services and are provided with uh, either inferior quality or short shipments. Um, there are conflicts of interest that occur within a procurement process where an individual can uh, contract with a family member or a friend or uh, with a company that doesn't exist. Many times we have what we would call a phantom vendor scheme in the procurement fraud area where someone would procure goods or services from a company that doesn't exist that was in fact created by the employee where they are processing uh, cash disbursements to these companies for a product that has never been sent. The uh, number of employees that are procuring goods and services for companies has changed dramatically. The nature of procurement fraud in today's business environment, everyone uh, is potentially a perpetrator of a fraud scheme occurring under the procurement process. Most associate with bribery and corruption or kickback schemes as off book and so they are much more difficult to investigate and the reason being is that any type of cash uh, that is kicked back to an employee or paid to a vendor in the form of a bribe uh, or a customer is generally made in cash or checks and it's off the books and records of the company so much more difficult to trace um, but when we look at those types of frauds they are unique in the sense that they generally do impact the books and records at some point by means of inferior quali quality product, uh, short shipments, uh, paying of exorbitant rates for services or materials that you're buying. So what we try to look at is the relationship. Uh, we try to look and determine if the same vendor is being used repeatedly. Are we competitively bidding uh, this project? Uh, who's opening the bids? Are they being reviewed both subjectively and objectively? Uh, when we look at the procurement process, there is a number of subjective processes that are included in procuring goods and services. So objectively, a company can have a policy in place uh, whereby anything over a certain threshold, say $20,000, is required to be competitively bid. Um, the subjective part of that is when the bids are received, who's reviewing the bids, are there rebids, um, are there change orders in the projects once these uh, projects are, are underway. Fraud examiners provide uh, valuable uh, resources to any company that is looking to implement uh, policies and procedures around the procurement of goods and services. And I say that because generally we've been exposed to so many, a variety of fraud schemes that you know, we bring up a lot of inherent knowledge around internal controls uh, that should be implemented and or designed to reduce the risk. So some of the things that, uh, that we often suggest are, number one, to have a policy. You know, employees need to be made aware that a policy exists and they need to be able to establish expectations and guidelines. Otherwise, sometimes they'll go off to their own devices and make their own decisions when it comes to procuring goods and services. Uh, secondly, uh, when it comes to educating employees, we need to educate them about how the procurement process uh, should be followed. Um, so the reason why I say that is because when I look at my own company, as big as we are, you might think that we have established policies and procedures that are consistently applied across the entire globe. And while that is true in certain locations, we do have some isolated locations that have smaller business uh, structures and they may in fact have less segregation of duties, less internal controls, which thereby increases the risk for fraud. Um, I mentioned segregation of duties, that's critical. The same person that is paying for the services cannot be the same person that is procuring the services, reviewing the bids, and making the selection on which vendor to use. Uh, and these sound like uh, very basic controls, but I think many people would be surprised at the number of large companies that don't even have these basic controls in place. In a procurement fraud, if you have a, a corruption scheme or a bribery scheme, or even a kickback scheme, when you have collusion between two or more parties, there's no interest in either of those parties coming forward. 
So you've got to be able to have strong interviewing skills to get people to tell you things that they otherwise don't want you to know about. Um, I think good data analytics. Uh, a lot of procurement frauds are uncovered analyzing data. You know, when we look at our disbursements, when we look at accounts payable, uh, being able to determine which companies are paid, perhaps the same invoice is paid on multiple occasions. Perhaps we have round dollar amounts being paid to a specific vendor, which could be indicative of splitting invoices to avoid delegation of authority limits. Uh, the ability to analyze the increase in vendor spend over a short period of time. One uh, red flag uh, that's uh, in, you know, inherent with certain types of phantom vendor schemes is that a vendor might start off small, a vendor who, uh, who doesn't exist, and after the person becomes comfortable committing the fraud, over time they'll begin to increase the amounts of the invoices. They'll begin to increase the frequency in which the invoices are submitted. Being able to analyze that data to detect those red flags is very, very helpful. So interviewing skills, analytical skills, both very critical to the fraud examiner when it comes to procure procurement fraud.